are fonts? Why are fonts? How do fonts? Where do they keep the fonts? Is this a font? What's all this? Calm down. I'll tell you. We'll start with letters. Letters are these things. Letters are glyphs to represent a sound in a language. Like, this is a glyph. And this is what it represents. <sighs> in general, glyphs can be drawn using a few strokes of a pen or pencil, which means we can write a lot of them really quickly on a page. It would be really annoying if we had to fill in all of our O's, or put a hole in the page to dot our I's, or color all of our F's blue so the alphabet is all dots and lines. Simple stuff, right? Well, here's the twist. This is a digital screen. You're looking at one right now. This is how you're viewing this image. Isn't it wonderful? If we zoom into this wonderful image, it looks a little more like this. Well, okay, it actually looks like this, but shh, put a red, green, and blue pin in that, and we'll get to that later. Let's say we want to make an H on this grid of pixels. It's pretty simple. Just draw a straight line down, straight line over, and a straight line down again. It's that, boom, end of video. Thank you for watching. But uh, how do we tell the computer to do that? Well, of course, with our first kind of font, the Bitmap font! A bitmap font is exactly how you would assume that you make a font. Just tell the computer which pixels to color and which pixels to leave alone. So for H, it's these ones. This method is easy to understand, simple to make, small to store, easy to display, and used everywhere in early computing. Back when your computer was the size and shape of a microwave, this is the way we did fonts, and it was great. So why doesn't everyone use it all the time? Bitmap fonts have plenty of drawbacks if you want your text to actually like look good, which is important with text. For starters, look at this A. Do you see anything wrong with it? What about now? Bitmap fonts are jagged and can look awkward as a result. Just look at those beautiful lines. They're so smooth. This is a thing that we call aliasing. To avoid it, we do a process to get rid of it. And that process is called anti-aliasing because computer scientists are great at naming things. Basically, if I want this line to be smooth, I can't just add more pixels to the screen. It's hardware, you can't just download more of it, just like you can't download more RAM, or download better AIM. No, we have to make the most with the pixels we have, so what if instead of just black and white, we use shades of white instead? POW! Anti-aliasing! <laughs> However, you do have to be careful with it, because otherwise it looks like this. The other main problem with bitmap fonts is that if you tell the computer how many pixels it should use and where, it gets really confused if you tell it to be a different size. Take our H as an example. If I tell the computer to make it two pixels bigger, it, what does it do? It has no idea. Just as a side note, the size of a font specifies how tall the glyphs are, like how tall the letters are. There's a whole bunch of standards to measure the text size, but we're just gonna use like just regular pixels for now to keep things simple. So we've got our H and we've told the computer to make it two pixels bigger. Now, if it were you or me, we'd probably just do this. But keep in mind, the computer isn't looking at an H. It's looking at this. I don't know why I'm making the noises myself. So how does it know what to do? It can't just extend every top and bottom of the character like that, because then an A would look like this, and a G would look like this. And if we increased it by 8 pixels, our H would look like this. Which is horrible, and that's not very good, is it? Now you may be wondering, should we just scale the bitmap? And I have an answer for you. No. This works if you're trying to look retro. But in basically all other contexts, it's a terrible idea. The computer has to stretch and squash certain things to get it to fit, and the anti-aliasing makes it look half-melted, and it's just a train wreck all around. Okay, so maybe we just make all of our bitmaps really big and scale them down. Well, then you have more problems. Now every character on screen is associated with an enormous image that is being scaled down and stored for no good reason. Plus, scaling down doesn't look that much better than scaling up. Maybe we can just build different bitmaps for each character, for each height. Well, firstly, have fun drawing the same letter hundreds of times, and good luck keeping them consistent with each other by hand. But secondly, remember that every font size you add is another font size the computer has to remember, and you don't want our font files to take forever to load. Bitmaps are great, and can look beautiful in some circumstances, but they're all but extinct nowadays, aside from certain specific uses. If you're going to be displaying fonts dynamically, in a streamlined way that doesn't involve this, we're going to need a different solution. Enter our next font, the VECTOR FONT! What is a vector, I hear you ask? Or maybe you didn't ask, in which case I'm going to explain it anyway because you're watching this freaking video. A vector is an image that isn't represented pixel by pixel, but line by line, using math to decide where the lines go and how they're colored. There's a lot of different ways to do this, but they're all long and really complicated to explain, so just know that it's a way of representing a shape to a computer instead of a pixel by pixel image. 
So, when the time comes to type the letter F using a vector font, the computer finds the vector, lines it up at the right size, applies a thing called hinting to maximize the pixel usage, and then applies that shape to the pixels using an algorithm to fill partially covered pixels with transparent ones, which automatically does anti-aliasing. Now don't tell me I know exactly what question you're about to ask. You're thinking, Doug, this seems a lot more complex than using a bitmap. To which I would say that is not a question, that is a statement. But allow me to tell you why you're wrong. Computers are not built as well to handle images as they are to just handle math. They've been built from the ground up to do math as efficiently as possible. They're not as good at displaying images and graphics, and that's why CPUs are this big and this expensive, when GPUs are this big and this expensive. Besides, it's literally called a computer. It can compute the location and geometry of a few points on a vector image much, much easier than it can recall an entire pixel-by-pixel -pixel image, even at smaller sizes. Plus, as an added bonus, the vector image comes with its own natural anti-aliasing and can be scaled up and down at will without needing to completely remake the vector. The computer has the vector, it just puts the pixels together for us, because technology is great. This technology isn't even new, either. Back in 1984, Adobe made the first widely used vector-based font system, known then as PostScript. Later this would be known as PostScript Type 1, because they would go on to make like 40 more. They wanted a font that could be printed on different printers at different sizes without causing problems. So they made the characters out of fancy curves and shapes instead of dots, and BAM! The first vector font was born. The lack of anti-aliasing meant it didn't look great, but it was way better than the stuff they had before. Fast forward to today, and it's what you're staring at right now. And nothing has changed since then. Except for all this garbage! It turns out that the human eye is really, 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 really good at noticing details on glyphs. Considering I can't see the milk in the fridge half the time, I'm amazed that I can notice that this looks wrong and this looks right. Why is that the case? Here's a really brief overview of everything that fonts have to do to actually look nice and all the extra stuff that the font file metadata has to store. Serifs are a slight projection finishing off a stroke of a letter in certain typefaces. Or the way I say it, the little nubs and notches at the end of the letters that make them look all fancy. Here's a couple, and here's a couple more. Not all fonts have these. If it's what's known as a sans serif font, that means it doesn't have serif, because sans means no. Fortunately, if you make a font, you're either making one or the other. There are serif fonts, and there are sans serif fonts. Legend has it that if you show mixed serif to a mirror and say me and three times in a row, an English major suddenly appears and beats the crap out of you. Kerning is the distance between letters. If programmers had their way, every font would be monospace, and the ultimate monospace utopia would be achieved! But no, English majors had to come in and ruin everything, so now we have to deal with kerning. Kerning is just the spacing between letters seen in this space here. Look at this T next to this Y. Tie. Now look at it next to this V. Tv. I did not edit this at all. This is just how it types. You'd think we want them to be the same distance apart, since they're basically the same shape. And yet the V looks wrong here, and the Y looks wrong here. So here we are. The human eye just naturally wants it to look that way. So the font has to keep track of that. Why does it do all this? The human eye is really good at finding patterns, but at the same time it is also terrible at finding patterns. So it will look at something like this and think it's wrong, despite the letters being exactly the same distance apart. Our eyes want to see the characters written with the same distance the human hand usually writes them. So the computer puts them here instead. This is what's known as equal perceived spacing, as opposed to actual spacing. Amusingly, the subreddit where people look at examples of bad kerning is called Kemming. This is because when you write an R and an N, and they're too close together, it looks like an M. And that's an example of bad kerning. On that subreddit, you can find stuff like this. Life is but if ul. Next up is a simple one. Wait. See how the letters on the left are a little skinnier than the ones on the right? That's font weight, baby. In general, if a font wants to be bold, it can get away with just increasing the weight of the stroke around the vector image. This is known as faux bold. But also, sometimes they don't. Sometimes they make two, three, four, five, or even six different separate versions of the same font using different weights. This helps for people who want to design different fonts, which might need to look different when displayed heavier or lighter, depending on the weight. But it also sounds really tedious to make. Usually there's just a bold variant of the font included, but some fonts have a half dozen different alternate variants for every single weight a user would need. While that's not usually contained within the same font file, it still is basically the same font six times. Or if you're lazy, you just use faux bold and call it a day. 
Italics are much easier to generate on the fly because the computer just takes the vector and bends it over slightly. But plenty of fonts randomly decided that no, we're just going to have a completely different font when you enable italics and make it look entirely different for no good reason. So as a result, the font has to store an entirely separate set of vectors for the italic variant of each character. Look, see how the serifs are different from earlier when we talked about serifs? You get, you get it? You, yeah, you get it. You, well done. I'm proud of you. Fonts can get away with just putting little, like, dots and squiggles whenever they need dots and squiggles. But, you guessed it, sometimes fonts just want to make their own vectors to represent those different symbols, because why not make the font file even bigger? Admittedly, with some special characters, this makes sense. But for some, it does not. Sometimes, you just gotta make your font WIDE! Usually the word processor takes the vector and stretches it out. This is one of those few cases where if you want a separate set of vectors for different widths, companies usually just make a whole new typeface with the new width. This is not to be confused with font size. Font size is just how big the text is. Optical size is way stupider. <laughs> Remember how vector fonts can use the same vector for different font sizes, as opposed to bitmaps, which need separate bitmaps for each size they want? Well, typographers looked at that and decided, nah, we don't want that and decided to make different vectors for different font sizes. So to increase readability, some fonts will have different vector sets depending how big the font is. This is to make sure that a super thin line on a 144 point font isn't literally invisible if it decreases in size down to an eight point font. Sometimes this can be auto calculated by the computer itself. You don't even need to do anything. But sometimes people just make their own and it increases the font's file size by a factor of a lot. There's a lot more to fonts than just this list, and any typist will tell you that, but this is just the tip of the iceberg for what a font file has to keep track of and deal with, including all those elements interacting with each other independently. And almost none of this would be possible if not for vector fonts, because bitmap fonts don't even stand a chance at trying to keep track of all this. I've saved the best for last, and I just want to say, you're welcome. Remember that red, green, and blue pin we put away earlier? No? Well, I do, and we're going back to it now. Quick recap, anti-aliasing is using grayish pixels around the edge of black pixels to give it more of a natural shape instead of this jagged mess. But if you zoom in real close to your monitor, closer, even closer, there, there, you see it? Do you see it? The left sides are red and the right sides are blue. Why? Why? I'll tell you why. Let's look at those pixels again, but let's see how they actually look. The human eye can't really tell the exact color of a pixel on screen at any given time. We're humans, our eyes blur to stuff together to see brightness better than we see color. As a result, when we're looking at really small images, like glyph characters, the computer can get away with a lot of different colors without us really noticing. Just look at this. It's everywhere. Have you noticed why yet? Okay, this blew my mind. The computer is using individual red, green, and blue lights in the pixel to increase the font's horizontal resolution by three times. The human eye can't see color distances from that far away, so instead of just grayscaling the whole pixel, it just turns off the red on the left sides and just turns off the blue on the right sides. It uses every single light emitter on your monitor to its advantage, displaying at a higher resolution than your monitor should be capable of. All of this is dynamically calculated at runtime, placing a vector on a series of squares and calculating the RGB values of each pixel before placing them on the screen. Because again, computers are really good at doing math really quickly. This is just a quick side note. Bitmap character sets could have subpixel anti-aliasing too, if you wanted, but that would be like trying to strap monster truck tires to a forklift. It'd be overly cumbersome and not actually that useful. Computer scientists and the English language are at odds with each other all the time, and fonts are no exception. The sheer amount of metadata, character information, and alternate character sets that can be contained within a single font is staggering. Bitmap fonts are objectively less versatile and usable in the modern age, but are small enough to fit onto things like BIOS chips, and can load extraordinarily quickly under the right circumstances. Vector fonts are the modern standard, having been improved since the early 80s to the point where they can effectively triple your screen's effective resolution in order to display smoothly. Fonts can be as basic or advanced as the user needs, with heavy, high file size fonts being used for professional designs and rendered images, and lighter, low file size fonts being used for things like web pages. Heavier fonts will have more alternate vector sets to make for a more visually appealing set of characters, at the cost of taking longer to load, unlike lighter fonts, which can load almost instantly. I didn't even get the chance to mention other less common types of fonts, like stroke-based fonts and segment display fonts. Both of those have their own very important uses, but they're seen a lot less often in computing, so maybe another time. 
The most important takeaway of this video though is that kerning is really hard to do correctly, and it's really funny when people get it wrong. So to play us out, here's some examples from r slash chemming. Thank you for watching. <laughs>